Our next topic is a big one. It's a method for root finding, but it's not just a single method. It's actually a template for many different methods. And they all share a common idea. If you're given a problem that you don't know how to solve, replace it with a similar problem that you can. Of course, the devil's in the details. So if we're given a function and we don't know how to find the root explicitly, let's say we are given a starting value x1. From there, I want to find a sequence of approximations that converge to a root. In general, I can't go there in a finite number of steps, and that's a new element. What we'll do is we'll replace the original function by a linear approximation near our current point. So the linearization of that function, or the first two terms of the Taylor series, are given by this. And that's the thing that I'll solve, and that'll define our next point. So we set L to 0, that defines x2, and then we can solve for x2 in terms of x1, which we know. So starting from x1, we get x2. Hopefully, x2 is better than where we started, if L was a good approximation. So we'll start there and do it again. Now we get an iteration that goes as long as we want. We could write that the next iteration, the next value, is equal to the current value minus f of the current value over f prime of the current value. That's Newton's method for finding a root. There are a lot of questions we could ask about Newton's method. Here are a couple of important ones. Will it converge? And if so, how fast? It turns out that the first question is pretty hard, but the second question is fairly easy. So we'll focus on that one. Suppose the sequence does a converge to a root r. Then the sequence of errors, which is the difference between r and xk, satisfies its own iteration. So we start from Newton's method, and from both sides we subtract r. So now we can replace all the x's by e's, and we get this expression. Now we'll use Taylor expansions in the numerator and the denominator. I'll keep the first three terms in the numerator. And the denominator, it's Taylor expansion of f prime, but that's a function in its own right. So we apply Taylor's theorem to f prime. In this case, I only need to keep two terms, it turns out. So in the numerator, the first term is 0 because r is a root. Then I can multiply both numerator and denominator by 1 over f prime at r, factor out minus ek in the numerator, and now we're at this expression. I have this infinite series in the denominator. I want to get it out of the denominator, and the trick for that is to use the geometric series. So here I have something in the form of 1 over 1 minus z. I'll replace that with 1 plus z, and then stuff that I'll ignore. Our error iteration now has the product of these two series, which I'm going to truncate at two terms each, with the understanding we've left out a bunch of stuff with higher powers of ek. Now I can multiply these together, again, just keeping the highest order stuff. And now we acknowledge that everything that we've ignored is of order ek squared or higher inside the parentheses. So the first two terms on this expression cancel out. And what we're left with is that ek plus 1 is equal to this times ek squared plus stuff that we're going to ignore. 
So as long as ek is small, we can ignore the higher order terms. And we can just say that the next error is roughly a constant times the current error squared. That's what we call quadratic convergence. So for example, if we had an error of 10 to the minus 1, we would expect that to become 10 to the minus 2, then 10 to the minus 4, then 10 to the minus 8. Finally, we'd get down to machine precision. So often we say that the number of accurate digits doubles at each step. Here I define a function f. And this is the function I want to find a root of. For Newton's method, I'm also going to need a derivative, so I define that as well. And when I plot the original function, I see that it has a root a little bigger than 0.8. Now, I don't know exactly where that is because it's not easy to solve this equation for x. So I'm going to use f0 in order to get what we'll call the exact root. So it's about 0.853. Here's Newton's method. I start off with 1 as my initial estimate, and then I'll do six iterations where I just apply Newton's formula each time. And if we look at the results of that, we see that it does seem to be converging to 0.853. In order to see the convergence rate, it's easier to look at the errors. Here you can see how, if you look at the exponents, they're approximately doubling at each iteration. That's a characteristic of quadratic convergence. It's a little bit more precise if you look at the logs of the errors, so I'll make a table of those. So when you look at the logs, they are very nearly doubling each time. 4.2, 8.6, 17.5, and then you hit machine precision and you can't go any farther. It's a little harder to detect quadratic convergence by a graph. So if this is a log linear graph of the error versus iteration number, you can see that it keeps getting steeper from one iteration to the next. That's true of a lot of different convergences that may not be truly quadratic. So to be sure that it's quadratic, you do have to look at the numbers. there are some things we need to keep in mind in Newton's method. So for that analysis to work, f has to have at least two continuous derivatives so that we can use the Taylor series. Also, we divided by f prime of r, so we have to require that that's non-zero. Remember that it's equivalent to saying we have a simple root, not a multiple root at r. And finally, while we showed that the convergence is quadratic when it happens, it's actually very hard to guarantee convergence at any particular problem. Sometimes finding a starting value is the hardest part. Finally, we have to talk about how to stop the thing. In principle, it goes on forever, but we can't wait. So we can stop, of course, when the difference between successive iterates is small. And you can show that that's a pretty good estimate of the actual error. That would be ideal, but of course sometimes we can't make the forward error small if the problem is ill-conditioned, so we also have to check the residual, which is the backward error. Finally, it might not be converging at all, so we have to stop if we're taking what we consider to be too many iterations. So if any one of these criteria are met, we'll stop. It's good practice to encapsulate one idea in a function like this. There are reasons that even for a simple thing like Newton's method, which you can do in just a couple of lines, um, it turns out that usually there are complications and extras that you want in place in general. And so in, instead of copying all those things to every single code you make, just make one function that everybody else can use. So here I have a function called Newton. As input, it accepts three things f is the function that we're finding the root of, df dx is a function for its derivative, and x1 is the starting point. 
We're going to define some parameters here. In a more sophisticated code, these would be optional inputs to the function as well, but we're just trying to keep things as clean and simple as possible here. Here's the setup. So x is going to be a vector of the results. You'll notice that's the thing that I'm returning from this function. It starts off just being the single number x1. y is f at that value. dx is where I'm going to store the difference between one step to the next. I'm going to set that to infinity so that the first time through the loop I'm guaranteed to go through. And then k is a counter for the number of iterations I'm on. So Newton's method's an example of uh, an iteration where we don't know the correct number of iterations in advance. We have to keep iterating until something happens. So usually you use a while loop for that kind of thing. So here you see that there are three conditions, and these are the three conditions that I mentioned. So as long as the difference between iterations is too big, okay, that was set up, that value was set up here, and also the residual is too big, again that was set up here, and we haven't exceeded the maximum number of iterations, that was parameter set up here, as long as those three things are all true, we're not done. So we will evaluate the slope, f prime, then we'll calculate the difference from one step to, a ne to the next in the Newton iteration, and then we'll apply that to get the next iterate. Finally, we'll advance the counter and we'll update the residual. So that next time through the loop, we're all set up to try it again. First, we'll check all those conditions, and if we're still not satisfied, we'll go through the loop again. Finally, at the end here, I don't simply want to pass a result quietly if I hit the maximum number of iterations. If I do hit the maximum number of iterations, something probably has gone wrong, and so this is MATLAB's way of issuing something that will be printed out, but execution will continue so that the value is returned.